Now we go to Fermilab where they're looking at the smallest, most weakly interacting particles in the universe in order to answer the biggest questions. My big question is, how, why am I small? Why, how do I get big? That's two questions, but you know what I mean. Oh. Guess what, Matt? The fine folks at Fermilab gave me a tour of their secret underground lair, which is neither secret nor a lair. I didn't get to go. Ah, you didn't miss much, except we got to ride an awesome vibrating elevator way underground into a tunnel-y you cave. Guys, anybody here claustrophobic? Uh-oh. <laughs> And I wore a hard hat. Yeah, whatever. They're not doing anything anymore, right? Yes, they shut, they, no, they are. They shut it down since the Large Hadron Collider started. No, they're still doing stuff. How can they do experiments with particles if they don't have a particle accelerator? They don't use an accelerator. They use the Earth. Like the planet? Yeah, the one that we're standing on. This one? This Earth. Well, you've got my notoriously fickle attention. How does that work exactly? The newest project at Fermilab, the NOVA experiment, is sending beams of particles 800 kilometers. That's about 500 miles in imperial units. Long live the empire. All the way from Batavia, Illinois to northern Minnesota, just next to the Canadian border, which is good that it stops there because Canadians don't want extra particles in their poutine. We're able to just point our beam down, send it straight through the earth to our detector in Ash River. So you just point directly at Minnesota. Point and aim, yeah. Through the earth. That's through the awesome. Earth. Pardon me, but how do you go about getting a beam of particles to go through the earth? Did they drill a tunnel or does the beam itself laser its way through the earth, causing massive earthquakes, social disruption, and widespread destruction? No, they don't have to do anything. They're shooting a beam of neutrinos. Oh, neutrinos from Dimension X. I guess they take their flying car all the way there. That's the Ninja Turtles. No, neutrinos are particles. Neutrinos have very little mass. They are 10 million times less massive than the next lightest particle, the electron. And neutrinos are very, very weakly interacting. They actually have a mean free path through lead of about a light year. A light year of lead? Yeah. You know, if you had a ball of lead that was a light year in diameter, it would encompass the entire solar system. You just know that? Cute, awesome animation. About 50% of neutrinos would pass through it like it wasn't even there. In fact, neutrinos are so abundant, trillions of them pass through us every second. Right now. Whoa. What's going on? Neutrinos are passing through my body, oh. but I don't feel it actually. Oh. But if I did feel it, that's what I would do. That's how I would react. Yeah? Is that how you react when you feel things? Yeah. Ah! So 800 kilometers of the Earth's crust is no problem for neutrinos, but why do they have to send them all the way to Minnesota? The main purpose of the NOVA experiment is to study neutrino, neutrino oscillations. Neutrino oscillations. Oh! What's that mean? I don't know. So I'm holding this um, Hoberman switch pitch ball. It's a toy, it's a kid's toy, but it, <laughs> it, it demonstrates some of the properties of neutrino oscillations nicely. So if I give it a light toss, you can see actually when I tossed it the first time, it changed from green to purple. You're tossing it. And when I toss it just a little bit, okay, yeah. it's not changing. So this is like the neutrino state. They have very little chance to oscillate when you just look at a short distance. Mm -hmm. But if you start going over more distances, Whoa. you see it changed from green, green. So there's some chance, well, uh, there's some <laughs> chance of it changing. And this is exactly what happens. As they, as they travel, there's some probability of it changing neutrino type. And you don't know that probability. And we don't know that probability. Okay, so over longer distances, there's a better chance that the neutrino will oscillate into its different forms or flavors. But something's bugging me, Craig. I noticed you've been a bit troubled. What's wrong? If neutrinos can pass through us, the Earth, a solar system-sized ball of lead, won't they pass right through the detector undetected? They do! But a small percentage of them, every once in a while, will interact with the detector. Especially if it's a really big detector. This thing is very large. When it's complete, it's going to be filled with about 3 million gallons of this liquid scintillator. Um, and it'll have a mass of about 14,000 tons. And this is about the weight of a, uh, of a battleship. Wow. So it's a very massive thing. And we need this mass because, as I described, the neutrinos so rarely interact. We think when this device is built in Minnesota that this is going to be the largest freestanding plastic structure in the world. Does Guinness have a record for that? We need to verify that with Guinness. <laughs> so that'll be the third world record holder that we've interviewed. Yeah, there's Mark Malkov. Yeah, and the paper airplane guy. I wonder if there's a world record for the most world record holder interviews. We'll look into it. No, we won't. Nope. So Fermilab's gonna look at these neutrino oscillations. Why? That's what physicists do. Sure, but that's it? They're just going to shoot a beam of particles into the Earth and watch them oscillate? We also don't know whether these neutrinos are what we call CP violating or whether their antiparticle partner interacts in matter in a similar way to the, to the regular type neutrino. And this would help answer questions about why the universe is matter dominated instead of antimatter dominated. Oh, that might be able to tell us why the universe exists, why we're here, why there's something rather than nothing, you know, boring stuff like that. That doesn't seem boring at all. That's the opposite of boring. Anti-boring. 
Get it? Antimatter? Anti-boring? Yeah, anti-humor as well. What is antimatter? Antimatter is the counterpart to regular matter. So if you have a piece of regular matter that has a charge, say an electron is negatively charged, its antimatter counterpart will have the same mass with an opposite charge. So antimatter is not naturally occurring. Everything that's in the normal universe is matter. So the real questions we're trying to answer is why is the universe matter dominated? What would happen if the universe was equal parts matter and antimatter? What if antimatter was around? Most likely the two two would find each other and annihilate, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't be in the universe that we're in. As we walk around, I'll look out for some antimatter. Yeah, watch out for can... it, though. If it interacts <laughs> with matter, it destroys it. So. Like, there might be an anti-Craig walking around? Yeah, so be careful. Oh, don't, no. don't hug him. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Or we'll lose you. And if there was equal amounts of antimatter and matter in the beginning, then the universe should have destroyed itself. There'd be no Earth, no neutrinos, no antipasta, no... Buffy season four, no diggity. Mm-hmm. The way neutrinos oscillate might be different than the way anti-neutrinos oscillate. And that difference might be what gave matter a tiny little advantage over antimatter and why we and diggity exist. Oh, it's a good thing antimatter doesn't exist, am I That's right? for sure. Oh, hey, who's that handsome devil? Oh, that's handsome, yeah. Put her there. No, wait, Craig, stop! Whew. Big thank you to Fermilab for letting us into your secret underground laboratory. Up next, many of you submitted miniature stories and we put them in a video. Oh, and thanks to John Collins for showing me how to make a paper airplane. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to that now. Oh boy.